Welcome to Customer Value Cast, a podcast dedicated to helping you acquire, retain, and expand more customers by putting measurable value at the heart of your customer lifecycle. Join our host, Ross Fulton, founder and CEO of ValueWise, as he dives deep into how reoccurring revenue businesses are maximizing their growth and valuations with the industry's leading experts and pioneers. Hello, welcome to today's episode of the Customer Value Cast, the show dedicated to putting recurring value at the heart of your customer lifecycle so you can retain and expand more customers. Today, very happy and excited to be joined by Steve Hazelton, who is the founder and CEO of an awesome company called Sturdy.ai. Steve, thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ross. Happy to, uh, to... sit here and talk to you folks. Yeah, no, I'm stoked. It's going to be a, an awesome conversation. For those listening who maybe haven't had a chance to connect with you before and or with uh, with your with your company, maybe share a bit about yourself and then and Sturdy, and uh, we'll uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, so like you mentioned, I'm one of the founders of Sturdy. Um, I started it with another fellow, Joel Passan, and um, uh, my cousin actually, Nathaniel Hazelton's our CEO. Joel and I. A number of years ago, started a software company called Newton. Some of you were listening. If you ever applied to a job in the last decade or so, one of your resumes may have ended up in our product at some time or another. We sold applicant tracking software to small and medium-sized businesses. We sold that business off to Paycor in Cincinnati, and the idea behind Sturdy came from the the, the massive amounts of customer interactions that large enterprises, but even small and medium-sized enterprises ingest every day. So we started off about four years ago, sitting inside a room reviewing uh, about a half a million support tickets to create a language model that will identify business topics at scale. That's the very simple explanation. Um, I'm sure uh, we can get into it more if you're interested, but basically we, we take every source of customer interaction, or we will someday, but email straight from the server, that could be Outlook or Gmail, um, tickets, chats, gong transcriptions or phone transcriptions, we ingest all of that, eventually even usage data, if you have that available, we can ingest that. Um, customer success uh, surveys or CSAT scores, NPS scores, we ingest anything, and then we use our business uh, language model on that to identify sentiment, themes and topics that are relevant to primary, you know, we, we started out in the B2B SaaS space, so the models work very well for that. So that's what we do. Um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's I think it's, I say, I know the product, it's very, very, very cool stuff. And safe to say that there's this very broad banner of AI and I will give um, advanced credit to our listeners and our audience. They're a pretty savvy bunch and all, most, most work in B2B technology. And so they're going to be aware of AI as a general concept, certainly as a, um, as a domain and a area of value for B2B companies. It has undeniably taken on a life of its own, only accelerated massively in the last few months with the far more public emergence of ChatGPT, et cetera, et cetera. However, I think there's still a very nascent state around the adoption of AI and all the different subcategories that sit beneath that within B2B uh, organizations, specifically around the application of AI, NLP, ML, et cetera, around the uh, the post-sales side of the customer lifecycle, thinking about trying to drive customer value, customer retention, expansion, et cetera. Less nascent, arguably, in the marketing sales side of the equation from a net new perspective in terms of applying that from a um, from a top of the funnel perspective, even around opportunity management and sales and in sales tech. But post sales, I think a bit more a bit more nascent. But maybe with acknowledging that our audience is sort of fairly familiar with the AI concept when it comes to the different components or um, I guess uh, themes within AI that you see as being relevant to B2B companies, especially looking to drive more advanced intelligence within their approach to a customer life cycle. How do you look at that whole huge domain and break it down into different sort of categories? 
I'll take a big sigh. That's a very, very good question. Um, and I think a really important one. Um, so AI, you're correct, is a, is a really, really broad term for a lot of things. You might go so far as to say that financial services companies, as one example, have been doing AI for quite a while. You give that, mm -hmm. you give a model a bunch of fraudulent transactions, and then you give a, a bunch of transactions that you don't know if they're fraudulent or not. You say, compare them and tell us, and that's AI. Um, I think the breakthrough that we're seeing uh, now, and I would I would be willing to bet that no one listening to this podcast right now uh, has, is not aware of ChatGPT or GPT-3 and 4 or OpenAI. And what we would call uh, large language models is, is what they are. And there's a number of ways of describing those, but you know, you know they, they can create content on their own, uh, natural language content. Um, and they're you know, extraordinary when, when, when you see them. They can be contained. You know, there's, a, there's other buzzwords around that. They are a neural network. They're learning on their own. They're, and if there's AI folks, uh, I know I'm oversimplifying if you're listening, but they're, a lot of them are doing what's called unsupervised learning, where they are learning without a human telling them what to do. I'd be willing to bet that there's more supervised learning going on in these things than they would admit um, because they need to be trained. And that's, that's one of the barriers to entry to all of these is the amount of human training that goes into it. So, you know, folks trying to build these AIs on their own, using their own data, they run into two, uh, two limits. One is the amount that you can spend training it. And two, they need a lot of data. Um, you were, you know, we will talk to folks that will say, oh, we want a model that will detect um, something in our own data that only we have. Uh, you're just not going to have enough data probably at, at, at where that's at. So um, that's really what we're talking about when we talk about today, when we're talking about the difference between AI writ large and what's really potent and powerful for your post sales businesses is the generative AI and it's the large language models that can that can write support answers. It can, you can say, summarize this conversation for me in two sentences or in eight sentences. I mean, if you really wanted to play around with it, you could say summarize it like a pirate in a pirate's voice. They actually do that too. I don't think that's really important, but for some reason they felt it was necessary. That's what we're talking about. How the, the you know, we would say that the challenge or the, the opportunity, I would say the opportunity that businesses have right now is the potential that's unleashed by using these technologies. Just basically imagine anything that you thought was impossible in your business around customer interactions and just say, could I do this now? And that, that's really exciting. Um, I can get into examples, but one real simple example would be imagine if you could just type what's going on with my top 10 customers right now. And it would just return, actually, XYZ Corp contacted you three weeks ago. They're a little upset about this feature that you didn't, and they also had a question about their bill. You go, hmm, that's not good. That's, that's what we're talking about with, with language models and AI today. Mm -hmm. I think the, certainly, again, I'm very much from an armchair observer position, but uh, yourself and, and many many of the listeners we have today who are maybe more on the practitioner side of things have always flagged it is it is availability of data that is certainly one of the core dependencies to really enable the application of these models AI etc um, in in businesses and value to be realized from that capability um, and today as you say huge huge strides being made it seems on a weekly basis around access to the capability other sort of chat GPT that still doesn't that still doesn't that doesn't remove the dependency or we've as an enterprise I need data and this is where I think it's very interesting on what Sturdy are working on in this whole area around unstructured data because if there's one thing these companies have especially the sort of the larger the larger enterprises but this applies to growth stage as much as well is unstructured data obviously unstructured uh, unstructured text data, emails, et cetera, to analyze and extract some of these, some of this intelligence and then start to sort of really automate um, the intelligent action off the top of that. That 
what what is it around the unstructured data thinking about emails etc which has almost like for me taken so long to be addressed as a key data source and like let's extract the intelligence because it's not like oh well we never had all that data before we never had millions of emails in our business containing the voice of the customer we've in fact that's been that's been there for decades um but only today are we really starting to get into leveraging that as a source of intelligence for certainly the post-sale motion i'm curious why if you think if you have a theory on why that is wow i'm super excited to answer that um that's <laughs> another really really good question i could go on for uh, 10 hours on this so but the one i would say the, the challenge is that this unstructured data is really, really difficult to deal with be, by nature of it being unstructured. And it's sitting all over the place. So, um, and it's also, there's a, there, it's also getting uh, duplicated and recreated over and over. Like when a customer submits an email to support, it gets copied into a case and the case gets assigned to a group. And then someone in the group picks that up that creates four action items in, in Salesforce or four event logs, and then you have four chunks of data that are identical. Um, so the first, the, 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 the question you asked was, why haven't we used this before? I would say email is a, one of the main culprits of this. It is almost impossible to get email out of inboxes, right? Like we've seen this before, everyone's gonna nod their head who's listening when someone leaves your team you end up with a little folder in your inbox that you go and check when you get an email from a customer, right? So you have to go directly to, you have to marry like a system of record like Salesforce with the inbox. So you need those deep integrations. So those integrations have not existed for a long time. In fact, I would say I could get a little bit um, too technical here, but I'll just bring it up. Like Gmail for years, in order to allow someone to act a system to access your email and to pull the email out, you'd have to give global read access. Company, any company that knows what it's doing will not allow that. Those things have changed now and they've gotten better. So on one side, we have these, this development of the technology to read and understand this unstructured data. And on the other side, we have the APIs that allow us to get us the data now, which is really, really cool because even though it's still you have to go and, and, and track it down and write APIs to get it. And then you have to bring it in and deduplicate, deduplicate it and marry it up to the account object in Salesforce and create like an account data object. But you can now get to the data and then you will spend time cleaning it. And now you can use it, which is really, um, we don't want to be an infomercial about Sturdy. That is what we embarked on years ago was we have to unlock email. We have to unlock tickets. We have to merge this all together in order to be able to create that comprehensive view of the customer. It's just not enough to say, go to Salesforce and look at an event log or go to, or an activity log or go to Zendesk. And I used to say to finish this point, and we've all been there. Why do I need to get five people in a room to know what's going on with my best customer, right? You can't run AI on that data if you still have to do that. Um, there's, it's sitting in, in, the reason why you get five people in a room is because it's in supports inbox, it's in Zendesk, it's in maybe Monday, it's in wherever it is. And, and it's really, really, it's really exciting to me to see that that stuff's getting unlocked now. Uh, I really, I'm excited about that. That's why I love that question because it speaks to a very, very big problem for a lot of enterprises. Yeah, and I, think, I think it's, I mean, it's important to me that, uh, yeah, these the conversations I have on this podcast as an example are really sort of drilling into not just the possibilities and the capabilities and the outcomes that are now available in through innovations like innovations in, in and around AI, but okay, what is what is the real life considerations and dependencies and really being able to apply that capability in real life inside B2B enterprises. And I think yet yeah, this data data access, data availability, um, uh, and just obviously all the security considerations that would wrap around that is, is a very, very important topic. Um, let's, I want to come back to the security piece for a second, because I think that's something important to, to talk about. But, but 
in terms of another type of dependency, and I'll use like ChatGPT and just uh, from my consumer perspective, um, if I look at it from that perspective around G chat GPT, super powerful, super cool, really good. But the way I extract value from that is really quite dependent on my ability to ask the right question or make the right request to that model or to that, to that application, to that service. Um, and I see the same concept in uh, B2B companies application of AI and this sort of more advanced analytics capability, NLP, et cetera, which is, let's say we've successfully addressed the data dependency in terms of access, availability, et cetera. Now I've got to know what questions to ask of it to be able to then extract the intelligence that really enables me to take next best action. Uh, Stevie, you're seeing sort of improvements around AI helping with the actual definition of those questions, or is that more or still, was that still a, really that's a strategy um, sort of piece of acumen that the business needs to have to say, look, this is our strategy in terms of how we drive value for customers. Therefore, I want to get these questions answered. So I'm going to get access to a service, which I can input those questions. And then it's going to do its super cool stuff using NLP and AI, et cetera, et cetera, to give me that intelligence back. But I really need to feed it the questions to begin with. Or are you seeing, you know what? No, AI is solving the actual definition of the question piece as well, because it's, enable, it's enabling to take a fairly democratized view of, well, these are all the questions that the best companies in the world are asking of their support ticket data. Let's package that up and apply it in, in, your, in your enterprise. Because um, today I'm seeing it the fairly manual exercise around, okay, cool capability, cool technology, we've got the data, we've still got to work out what questions to ask to enable us to get the intelligence that we will be really important for our business relative to where we're at as a business in terms of what types of churn risk or, or what. Yeah, um, so that's, that's the, that's like the trough of disillusionment, maybe if you want yeah. to use that overused term, or that's the risk to an AI project, I would think is that the summarization of noise is just summarized noise. So, and, and what I mean by that is if you have 5,000 emails and you load them into one of these generative AIs and say, give me a summary um, of each email, you're gonna end up with 5,000 summaries and no one has time to read it. So the challenge that, that, that you will have is you want to tell the, the AI, um, I, for example, when a, if someone detected a bug report, if a human being detected a bug report manually, they would say, summarize this and load it into JIRA. Um, and ideally, you would have a system that would say, we've detected a bug report in this email, send it to, to an AI that would summarize it for you and forward it. So yeah, you want that is going to be a challenge is you, there, there are these challenges around these technologies. You can't just go and say as a CEO or, a, or a VP of customer success, let's start using uh, open AI tomorrow to summarize all of our support conversations. It's just, it will create some wonderful results, but you'll still will end up having to read a lot of surveys. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 And I think it's, uh, I think I, I see it, uh, we're focused on it particularly acutely around the subject of, Give me advanced intelligence, give me predictive insights, give me next best, next best actions in the context of how I get my customer closer to achieving the measurable outcome, the value they want to achieve through using my my, my software product. Um, and certainly my, my take on that is that, well, that definition of outcome, that definition of measurable value that you want your customers to achieve through using your product is a very sort of bespoke, relatively unique set of definitions that relate to, well, who are your customers? What does your tech do, et cetera, et cetera? How does your pricing model work? Um, and so to be able to then ask these models will give me that leading insight, give me that intelligence on the subject of outcome achievement. I need to do that work up front to say, well, based on these definitions of value and outcomes, these are therefore the questions around um, risk or adoption indicators that I would ask this massive unstructured data. Yeah, and data. I might say that that would be your, your, for a certain business, those definition, like defining the outcome that you want for that customer would be, to some degree, your proprietary, your secret sauce or your own outcome. Yes. You would use the AI to provide you the data 
that you need to fit into your own algorithm instead of expecting the AI to determine that for you. Um, so I might say, we need to know the percentage of our customer conversations that are unhappy or um, specific. And that's like a data point. That's not an actionable insight perhaps, but, and again, to, to, to pitch kind of what we do, we try to identify the actionable insights in this data. And then we ask the AI for more information about it. So we would detect like a salesperson uh, will detect over promise, which is a really, really powerful signal, right? Um, I, uh, we bought this product and we thought that it had advanced charting in it and it doesn't. Uh, wow, we need to act on that. And there's a number of places that we will address that in our organization, right? Asking the AI to say, how do we address over promise might be a reach today though. Do but you promise, do the companies do that? I don't, I've never heard of that before. No, but no, I love that as an example. It's uh, so, so true. And I love, yeah, I love, I love the concept with the analogy for one of a better word of, yeah, that each, B2B, certainly enterprise, they, they, they need their own proprietary algorithms that then they sort of fuel with this more service-based set of algorithms that AI and, and companies are making available. Um, yes. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's a really it, interesting way of framing it. To bring it kind of to a personal story about this, when we, when I, um, when we sold Newton, I, they, I became a GM of a business unit and went from having uh, a team that I understood our product and I understood our customers quite well and then went to a company that had 28,000 customers and was made a GM of a business unit. I had no idea what was making our customers unhappy or happy or what feature requests or bugs and I had nowhere to go to get that data other than to have kind of ad hoc meetings where we would kind of go through, you know, JIRA and be like, hold on, we have 28,000 customers. And last month we recorded 10 bugs, you know, mm, not probably <laughs> accurate, right? Or we only have you know, 25 feature requests. So we have to, to feed those algorithms that are going to help us predict or to um, drive retention. We have to create data for them. And I think that that's one of the opportunities, the first opportunity that you would realize in your business by looking at AI would be, how are we going to turn all of this unstructured data, like everything in our business into something useful, not just for the human being that's reading that email and processing it and storing it in their own brain and using it for future interactions with that customer, but how are they going to move that forward into after they get promoted or after they go to another group, how is someone else going to leverage that information either for that customer or for everybody else in the business, whether that is, and we look at this as both kind of a pre and post sales motion, analyzing all of that data across that journey. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. The, uh, so I mentioned security, I guess, I think maybe the word I wanted to use was more so was privacy. Um, and yeah, the, again, mass excitement, which is, I think, rational around the application of AI. Um, today, we're recording this in, in sort of spring 2023. Um, the risk of, well, hang on, hold your horses. There's the adoption dependencies we've talked about, data, thinking about the data exhaust and the strategy and the proprietary algorithms around the science of how you drive customer adoption, customer value, and connecting it to, to, the, to the capabilities out there in, in these services. But there's also then the risk side of it, and I think security privacy is is a big one. Uh, what do you what do, would you flag to listeners who are thinking, hey, we're about to or in the midst of of deploying the AI initiatives, AI based initiatives for our customer lifecycle? Um, what would you be sort of flagging to them to say, hey, make sure you group your ducks in a row in these sort of security and or privacy areas in a, in a B two B context? Yeah, um, another really good question. I, I I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Um, you really, really cannot just drop an email into OpenAI and ask it for a summary if there's someone's name in it. Uh, you could say, well, we're not in California or we're not in the European Union, and so it's not a big deal. I'm not saying you've done that already, but if you have, it's not it's not going to fly. And at scale, it really won't. They become a subprocessor when you do that. So you will need to take steps to make sure that you redact 
that data. And how you do that, of course, is there, uh, we won't get into that. Um, that is definitely, definitely something you need to think about as well. You are gonna have to add, there are ways you, you theoretically could get around it, but um, that would be, you know, kosher. I'm not saying to try to skirt the legislation, but just keep that in mind. Like if you are dropping someone's email address out of an email into, a, into one of these online services without stripping away their first name, last name, title, email address, address, you're, you're flashing. And I guess theoretically that is a data breach. So you would, yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to tell you that that means you shouldn't use AI, but that's certainly something that comes up in every customer we talk to today. The, I will say many of us who've been in the software space for a long time can remember just six or seven years ago, these kind of discussions did not happen. No one, it was really rare where we were talking about privacy. Today, the, 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 the market has changed. It's just something you have to do. And by the way, there are AI tools for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, very, very meta. But yeah, I think yeah, such a and not a new, it's hardly a new subject. Uh, the the giddy days of of um, back many years ago now of just the innovation around marketing automation. It was the same question. It was the same consideration. It was hold your horses, think about this because I mean maybe less so back then because the legislation wasn't quite as mature or or as uh, as pervasive. But um, I think today it's a completely different different game. Uh, I want to get. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, well, no, I was going to say it is a different game. I mean, we could, we could make the. I mean, there's. A, I don't want to tell people that I necessarily agree one way or the other. I certainly believe you have a right to know what people are using your data for. We could make the case that, like, if I'm using, if you send me an email and I use an AI to summarize it and it sends me some information back and I handle your 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 request more effectively, you would totally want that. And, if, and that's the other thing I'd like to bring up, like. If a customer in a B2B environment is communicating with you in email or support, they want you to do a better job. They want you to use every tool at your disposal to make them happier, to build their features, to cut their costs, whatever it is. They want you to do this. Um, you just have to be careful about releasing that personally identifiable information to another entity. That, that I. That's the way I look at it. It is different than a B to C environment um, where the expect where you're harvesting someone's name off of Facebook and and reselling it. These people are asking you, how do I do this? Why did you sell me an analytics package that doesn't work? They want you to address these issues. They want your your executive management to, to recognize. Them. Yeah, no, I think it's, that's a great, great, great shout. It's safe to say the 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 domain uh, of AI, its application in B two B, and and every other every other sort of vertical um, today we're focusing on B two B. The rate of evolution is just mind blowing. I mean, thanks to certainly Open AI and in, in recent months, but just in general, it's it's crazy, crazy, crazy. And so we have to sort of have a quick chat around well, what what is the future and uh, we can we, we we've got a, had a good got a, had a good little chat around types of use cases today and um, what we can do and we were seeing kind of the super cool demos out there with with generative AI and you draw something on a napkin a website and suddenly it exists etc but for our focus around B2B customer lifecycle what, what are you forecasting without Sort of necessarily um, giving any any secrets away or uh, certainly making any commitments. But what are you seeing as we do this again in in even six months time, but let's say a year's time? What are we talking about as the uh, as the real life use cases um, then when it comes to applying this type of AI for for this B two B customer lifecycle? Yeah, I would say um, I'll give a. A definitive answer before I give this kind of metaphorical one. Think about the internet when it first started. It was, it was chat rooms and kind of. I mean, I can remember. I'm old, but you'd go into like the commuter lab and you'd be, you'd be typing in a, a chat to somebody around the world, and you thought it was the coolest thing. Interesting, um, a parallel to we're using chat bots today, and we're saying, "Wow, look at AI." Think about the internet then versus the internet now. Um, the, f the first point I would make is I would, s I can remember way back when 
hearing companies say, oh, we'll never sell anything on the internet. Those companies don't exist, right? No one would say that today. And that's where we, I, I would believe today, and I, I have to kind of look backwards and say, am I saying this because I run an AI company, but as I try to be self-aware, I, I believe that that is the same, we are in the exact same shift right now. Um, maybe even more powerful than the internet. I mean, it, we're, we're looking at, and people have said this, but I think we're looking at five or 10 years from now, you will look back on, on this year really and say how much difference are, different are things now than they, than they were. And there will, be, there will be things you can't even imagine. I would say the low hanging fruit or the easiest prediction to make is that a lot of the manual labor, the digital manual labor is gone. So it won't be gone immediately, but if you see a feature request, log it to JIRA, that's gone. That, this, these systems are doing this for you. And the faster you get to doing that or accomplishing those objectives in your business, I would say the better, there'll be a bumpy ride. So it'll be easier for some than others. But you have to then look at if the amount of percentage of your day that is manual labor, what is that going to mean when that is gone, right? So um, I think, as I would say, I don't want you to be fearful about this, although there, you may not be able to avoid it, but um, there is, I think, this concept that your job is not going to get replaced by AI, no matter who you are, but it will be replaced by someone using AI. I don't know if that's like a pilot, right? Plane, some, some planes today would not fly without computers. They just don't, they're not even an airfoil anymore. And the human being just sits there and kind of says, is everything going all right? And then if it's not, hit some buttons to fix it. I think we may not be going to that future, but we're getting there. I can see um, in, in this group of folks, of course, like I mentioned, the manual labor, I think the user interface of software will fundamentally change. I can see a world where, oh, when you log in, you go here and click this, and then you click that. You just log in and say, show me the thing I want. And it just, right, hey, tell me what's going on with my 10 best customers. What's, what's going on with Acme Corp? You just ask it, and it will just give you the data. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more what we would call cross-modal integration between you're not going to think of AI is going to unite all of your backend data sources into one coherent data model. So you're going to say, um, you're not going to say log into Zendesk to find that and log into Salesforce to find that and log into email to find that. You're just going to type into an interface and get the data you want. That's the easy stuff to predict. Um, I think th there will be things like smart knowledge bases, right? I mean, that your knowledge base is just going to be almost human. It's just going to answer questions for people without, without need for any interaction. I would say... And I challenge myself to, the, to think of this all the time, like just think of everything that's impossible right now around interacting with customers that you would want to have happen, that you've already always dreamed of happening. And say, could an A, could a, in a, in a future world, I know it sounds impossible, could it happen? And I would say AI is likely going to make it possible. I hope I answered it with enough specifics. Yeah, that's no, kind of I, 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 I think that's the perfect summary. I mean, I think to sort of recap that, I think there's the it's the inevitability of this this AI transformation and how that dominates how every organization, but our focus B two B is going to really approach their customer lifecycle. I think there's it's almost I think as much as the AI side of things is gathering rapid pace, as we talked about uh, earlier in the show, still relatively nascent at an adoption level in, in B2B. What's happening right now that is, I think, almost the foreshadowing and is a bit bit more advanced around adoption is just digital, digital engagement of customers in B2B, which is, the, in my mind, the, the, the perfect sort of just where tilling the soil, getting ready for the, the AI wave with this digital side of things, because they're, they're very ultimately complementary. Um, but in the same way that, yeah, I don't think there's a B2B company out there today, at least in the technology space, that is not 
thinking about, if not already working on their digital customer engagement adoption strategy, the same is going to happen. And in many cases already happening when they think when it, when it's AI, so you've got the inevitability, but it's also just the, yeah, I mean, it requires some drugs or something, but the unlocking of the imagination just to say, okay, where is this going to go? And what do I need to have on my roadmap here? What can I have on my roadmap here as it relates to how I approach my, my B2B customer life cycle with this uh, AI potential? I think I'm glad you brought up the, the human element of it around it. Well, what does that mean for, for all the professionals um, that, um, including us, that work in, in, in the B2B sort of customer life cycles space? Um, and I really like that pilot analogy and maybe sort of would extend it in terms of just the, you think, military and the drone concepts and sort of taking pilots out of the planes and they're now on the ground. But they're still instrumental in piloting and guiding and the strategy of what the drone's doing. They're just not up in the sky doing the thing anymore. And I think that sort of drone pilot as, as the, maybe an analogy for the future of um, certainly some some key customer uh, centric roles in the future is is maybe uh, maybe a uh, maybe has some relevance to to where this is going yeah, I think so I mean it, to take your analogy even further like a lot of those drones are just just massively networked mm-hmm. um, machines I mean they're co- gathering information um, and feeding that back to a central repository for a human being to to review we're probably along that similar trajectory right now right where there's going to be less of this customer satisfaction survey and we're just going to be able to generate that stuff out of the customers interactions directly instead of asking them what they how they feel about us we'll just know that we'll be able to create that on our own Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i've I've talked with like scott mccorkle as an example about this concept of a of a network effect and that network effect being facilitated by this true networking in the B2B space around, hey, well, I'm your customer, but you're, you're, you're the vendor of my customer over here, and they're the vendor of me. And there's just this whole interconnectivity around sort of value being sold, delivered, and re- received across all these B2B companies. And the data and the, just the, yeah, the, the science that underlies all that, we lift that up into a more of a networked model what can be what can be achieved around the collaboration and just the efficiency of getting getting success realized by companies from each other products i think it's a very compelling idea and i think it's i think it's real and i think ai is going to ultimately accelerate to uh, accelerate the potential of it yeah i mean i would hope in the future world that this allows us i, I don't want a dystopian future where the computers are just answering all of our questions incorrectly at scale, right? The goal here is that it's going to improve, that, that is the number one, the guiding light is that, we'll, that it will improve our interactions with our customers and it will help us get the data we need to make better decisions to improve um, their lives or their interactions with our own products, right? Because I, I, I do go back to the consistent theme here. When a customer contacts you in a B2B environment, they want you to help them. So the tools that you put in place to better understand those interactions, whether those are logins, whether those are intercom chats or emails or gong phone calls or whatever they, they might be, they're going to allow you to, to, the customer wants you to use that data to make, yeah. to improve their experience. And however, whatever tools you can put in place to do that. And I think AI is finally going to allow you to do that at scale. You do that. I think to to overstate my point, like you kind of do that when you're a small company, you either go, if you don't do that, you go out of business. But when you are doing it well, it's almost telepathic. You don't have a whole lot of customers. You kind of understand what they're doing. You've got co-founders or senior level people doing a lot of the interactions. And as you scale, you tend to push off those very valuable interactions almost in the opposite direction you should. They're going to lower, I I hate to use this term, lower level, but less experienced individuals in your organization, higher turnover individuals in your organization. Um, You know, we've seen organizations, uh, I won't name ones that I've seen, but with, you know, in their support teams, it's 200% turnover. So Mm -hmm. there's, there's data coming into these organizations that just can't get processed by someone who's only been there for six or eight months, right? And you're just letting that get wasted. 
uh, you do, you can't afford to have really expensive people doing those jobs, but you can certainly have an AI help you collect data and understand those interactions better. Yeah. I think that's where we're at. Yeah, no, love it, love it. We'll leave it there. Steve, really appreciate your time, the discussion and the insights. I knew it was going to be compelling and it absolutely was. For everyone listening, thanks again for joining this episode of the Customer Value Cast. You can certainly go to www.valuewise.co and uh, access a ton of resources on a lot of the subjects we've covered. Do check out sturdy.ai as well for more information and more insights on this subject as well from Steve and your team. Uh, we're, 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 we're excited to partner with Sturdy. I think it's a very, very, very cool product. Um, but yeah, for those listening, thanks again for joining. Valuewise yourself, valuewise your customers, and we'll uh, see you next time. Steve, thanks again. Thank you.